Section 14 of Astounding Stories 11, November 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roxanne Weber, R-O-X-A-N-N-E-W-E-B-E-R.com. Astounding Stories 11, November 1930, by Various. Story The Gray Plague, Chapter 3. At no time while he was held captive by the Venerians was Parkinson as hopeless or as completely filled with despair as when he was carried into this room. There was something depressing about the chamber, something that gripped his heart with the chill hand of dread. He had a feeling of impending evil. The few momentary glimpses of the chamber that he had gotten while he was being carried sufficed to convince Parkinson that this was a laboratory, or, he shuddered at the thought, an operating room. The walls, floor, and ceiling were composed of a white porcelain-like substance. From these walls, strangely streamed the same coppery light that filled the entire meteor. Entirely concealing one wall was a long glass case constructed to form countless little niches, each of which held a small transparent vessel. At the back of the room was a high table covered with transparent cases which were filled with complex instruments of every description, some similar to those on Earth, others entirely different. The thing that brought the thought of an operating room to Parkinson's mind was the long white slab that rested on metal uprights in the room's center, an operating table. A moment after they entered the room, he had his theory substantiated. The Venerian leader placed him on the white slab, stretching him to full length. It was an operating table, and he was to be the subject of their operation. He had lain there but a moment when two of the Venerians approached, one on either side, and began removing his clothing. It was nor long before he lay on the cold slab, entirely nude. While he was being stripped, he heard the leader of the Venerians moving about, heard the click of glass, the rasp of metal upon metal. But, unable to move his eyes, he had seen none of his activities, except to note that several of the little vessels had been taken from their resting places. When the two had finished disrobing him and had replaced him upon his back, the leader appeared. He looked down at Parkinson, a queer expression in his hard blue eyes. He seemed to hesitate a moment, then he spoke. Earthling, he said in his toneless voice, I have decided to tell you of our intentions. You are going to play a very important part in our scheme, and it is only fitting that you should know. You can do nothing to hinder our plans. You are giving us incalculable aid, and it affords me some degree of satisfaction to tell you this. As you know, Earthling, we propose to have the people of Accor to come to Earth to live, to relieve the congested conditions of our own world. Obviously, there is no room for two types of intelligent beings on one planet. Your race must go. It is our intention to destroy all human life on Earth. We intend accomplishing this with Venerian microbes. From the record of your knowledge, I've learned that disease of various kinds are common on Earth. We expected that such would be the case, and thus, you would not be immune to germs, so we came prepared. Each of the small compartments in that case that you may have seen contains a culture of a different germ. After we have determined which Venerian bacilli will be the most effective, we will develop them in great quantities and loose them upon your world. In the selecting process, you will play your part, since your germs may have a different effect upon your body than they do upon Venerians. We will inoculate you with different diseases and watch their effects upon you. Of course, you yourself will be in no great danger, for we will have the disease under our constant control. On a core, we have abolished disease entirely, having a reagent or an antitoxin for every malady. We will use our cures upon you immediately after we have seen how you react to each disease. What we desire is a bacillus that will take effect when it is breathed in through the lungs. If the disease is of such a nature as to instill fear in the minds of observers, so much the better. But that is unnecessary. When we discover a microbe of that nature, we will be ready to act. By the way, our work has been lessened to a great degree by the fact that you are a bacteriologist. The knowledge we gain from you has enabled us to eliminate at least half of our microbes. 
all Venerian germs that are duplicated on Earth will be left out of our calculations. Only those unknown to your planet will be tried upon you. When the Venerian had finished his explanation, each word of which sounded like a death knell to Parkinson, the bacteriologist lay on the slab in the grip of a nightmare of horror. The cold-blooded brutality of these Venerian beasts, and the thought of lying there helpless with his body the prey of unknown diseases, filled him with a maddening fear and dread. Mightily he struggled to break the uncanny bonds that held him paralyzed, but it was of no avail. His body retained its helpless rigidity. Only for a moment was Parkinson left to his fearful musings. Then the Venerians began their work. A tall table on wheels was brought from somewhere and drawn to the side of the slab. Upon this, various instruments were placed, side by side with numerous flat vessels containing germ cultures. Parkinson saw none of this, but from the sounds that came to his ears, he could infer what was taking place. Finally, everything seemed to be in readiness. The Venerian leader bent over Parkinson for a moment, and the latter felt a sharp pain in his side. Then the Venerian withdrew. Slowly, interminably, the time dragged by while the microbes that had been introduced into his body were at their work. How long he lay there with the Venerians watching, he could not tell, but it seemed to be hours. During that time, he felt himself gripped by an increasingly violent fever. Unbearable heat flooded his body, and because of his helplessness, he could do nothing to relieve his pain and discomfort. It was maddening. When he thought he had reached the limit of his endurance and felt that he would go insane in another moment, the Venerian leader injected something into his side. He became aware of an immediate sense of relief. In an unbelievably short time, the fever had left him and he was himself again. There followed for Parkinson hours of nightmare agony while the Venerians experimented with his living body. Time after time he was inoculated with strange bacilli that racked him with tortures indescribable. Hideous diseases covered him with festering sores, twisted his flesh into a repellent mass of scars, left him weakened and deformed. Had it not been for the incredible curative powers of the Venerians, he would have died then. But always when the end seemed at hand, they brought him back to life only to subject him to other horrors. After what seemed countless ages, the Venerians left him alone. Under the powerful effects of their cures, Parkinson began to recover. Hope welled up in his heart. Perhaps the terrible experiments were ended. When he was almost certain that the torture was over, his hopes were suddenly destroyed. The three Venerians approached again, each bearing a number of vessels containing germ cultures. These they placed on the table at Parkinson's side. Then two of them withdrew, leaving the leader to continue his work. Uttering a few words in the Venerian tongue, he occupied himself with something on the table, and a moment later turned toward the bacteriologist, a long needle in his hands. Parkinson felt a great burning pain in his left arm, as though a searing hot needle had been thrust into his flesh. In a moment this vanished. Then a feeling of irresistible lassitude overwhelmed him. An unbearable weariness filled him with longing for rest, peace, death. This, too, was of short duration. With the passing of the weariness, Parkinson became aware of a sharp throbbing in his arm. Rapidly this increased in violence until suddenly an unbearable, excruciating agony seized him. Far greater was this than any pain he had suffered before. For a moment he struggled to scream, to move, to do anything to relieve his agony. There seemed to be a sudden snap. A cry of anguish burst from his lips and his senses left him. Just as the bonds of paralysis had broken, he had lost consciousness. Life returned to Parkinson very slowly. In a daze he stared around, uncomprehending. Then suddenly he realized that he was no longer paralyzed, nor was he in the operating room. The bed on which he lay was soft, comfortable, the room unfamiliar. But not for long did his mind dwell upon this. In a few moments, his eyelids closed, and he slept the sleep of complete mental and physical exhaustion. During the weeks that followed, Parkinson did little other than sleep. Occasionally he arose, either to stretch himself or to secure food, but for the greater part of the time, he remained in bed, 
His body was a mere shadow of its former self as the result of his terrible experience on the white slab. His incessant sleeping, necessary because of his weakened condition, served to bring him back to his former health. The Venerians seemed glad to have it thus. Asleep, he did not disturb their activities. When he had awakened from his first period of natural slumber, he had received a terrible shock. His left arm was gone, amputated at the shoulder. Strangely, the wound had healed while he slept, probably the result of the Venerian doctoring, so there was no pain. But the shock had been terrible. After he had recovered from the effects of that shock, he had resolved to make the Venerians pay for what they had done. And then he had realized that the inhuman brutes must be destroyed for a greater reason. Unless he interfered, he believed that they would carry out their intention of destroying all human life. As the weeks passed by, while strength was returning to Parkinson, he learned in a general way what the invaders were doing. They were engaged in developing vast quantities of microbes to be spread over Earth. When these were ready, a great amount of fine dust that the Venerians had brought with them was impregnated with the bacilli. This was then taken up into the tower, where, as Parkinson learned later, it was blown out throughout the four tubes that spun around the tower's top to drift through the air, to enter human bodies, to destroy life. The Venerians worked with the cultures and impregnated dust without protection of any sort. Evidently, they were immune to the disease. Later, Parkinson learned that he was likewise immune. They had rendered him so after trying the germs upon him. Gradually, the bacteriologist's health returned, so gradually that his captors seemed not to notice it. He was glad of this, for their vigilance had relaxed and he did not want it renewed. Even when he was as strong and well as ever, he spent much time in bed, shamming illness. And when he could do so without danger of detection, he kept a close watch upon the three, waiting for a time when he would be entirely alone. At last, his opportunity came. The three Venerians rose to the surface together, leaving him in his room, to all outward appearances, asleep. But sleep was far from him at the moment. He had been watching. Shortly after the sphere had banished up the shaft, Parkinson emerged from his room. For a moment, he surveyed the circle of doors. Then he shrugged his shoulders. They all looked alike to him. Quickly, he crossed the room, then pressed a button that mechanically opened a door. It was his purpose, first of all, to secure a weapon. One room would do as well as another for a beginning. At first glance, Parkinson was struck by the strange familiarity of this chamber. Then, after a moment, he recognized it. A tall, high-backed metal chair in its center was its mark of identification. This was the chamber wherein the Venerians had transferred a record of his knowledge to their minds. Carefully, he looked around in search of a weapon, but the room held nothing but the chair and the thought transfer device. In a moment, he withdrew, closing the door behind him. In the next room he entered, he was fortunate. This chamber was filled with strange devices of various kinds. While curiously inspecting the intricate machines, he saw something that brought a smile of satisfaction to his lips. Against one wall stood a tall glass case, one of the shelves of which held several metal devices that Parkinson immediately recognized as being the Venerian's weapons. Poignantly, he remembered how a similar device had destroyed a ship. Leaving the door slightly ajar, he crossed to the case and secured one of the weapons. For a moment, he studied it. There was nothing complex about the mechanism. A cursory examination sufficed to reveal how it was operated. Pressure on a little knob on the back of the handle released the devastating ray. He was about to slip the device into his pocket when he stiffened involuntarily. There was a sound of movement outside the room. He heard a step on the metal floor, then he whirled. One of the Venerians stood in the doorway, a menacing frown on his face. He was crouching, ready to spring upon Parkinson. Quick as thought, the bacteriologist leveled his newly acquired weapon and pressed on the knob. There was a sudden spurt of flame from the Venerian's body. Then it crumpled, sagging, shrinking together. Hastily, Parkinson released the pressure on the little knob, aghast at the destructive power of his little weapon. Then, as he remembered the torture he had endured at their hands, he directed the ray upon the ashes until they too were consumed, leaving not but a dark patch on the floor. For several minutes, Parkinson stood there in deep thought. There was no immediate danger from the two remaining Venerians, for they were up in the tower, while the sphere was in the meteor, so he could think with utmost safety. 
Deep thought and careful planning were necessary now, for he had taken the step that must mean either his death or the death of the Venerians. Suddenly he leaped into action. He had decided upon his next move. Crossing to the case, he secured another weapon. He wasn't sure that they could be effectively discharged without reloading. Handicapped as he was with one arm gone, he had to be certain of the reliability of his means of defense. Then he left the room and crossed to the huge Thok sphere. It was the work of a moment to enter this and prepare to ascend. This done, he turned his attention to the numerous knobs on the wall. He had not seen them for quite a while. It was with difficulty that he recalled which knobs controlled the car's ascent. At last, hesitantly but correctly, he pressed on the knobs and the sphere rose slowly toward the surface. At the proper moment, Parkinson brought the vehicle to a halt and slid back the door. Furtively, he peered around. The Venerians were on the other side of the tower. Quickly, he lowered the ladder and descended. As he stepped to the floor, a sudden cry of dismay fell upon his ears. One of the Venerians coming around the car had discovered him. Without a moment's hesitation, Parkinson aimed his little weapon and pressed upon the knob. Like his fellow, the Venerian fell to the floor, a heap of shard ashes. With the second Venerian destroyed, Parkinson dashed around the sphere, metal cylinder held in readiness. The leader of the Venerians was stealing stealthily around the other side of the car, his hand fumbling beneath his garment. Stop! Parkinson cried. Raise your hands above your head. Empty! A cylinder clattered to the metal floor as the Venerian's hands moved skyward. Keep your back turned, Parkinson snapped as the invader began about. I won't hesitate to press on this little knob at your first hostile move. I'd thoroughly enjoy burning you to a crisp, so be very careful. While talking, Parkinson had moved slowly toward the man from Venus. Now almost upon him, he quickly dropped his weapon into a pocket and swung a terrible blow at the base of his skull. The Venerian fell to the floor without a groan, unconscious. Parkinson stared at the recumbent figure, rather dubiously for a moment. If only he had his other arm, but it was gone. With an impatient shake of his head, he stooped and raised the senseless invader. It was anything but an easy task for the bacteriologist to carry his seven-foot burden up the ladder and into the sphere, but finally he succeeded in doing so. Then, without delay, he lowered the car into the meteor again. As he bore the Venerian from the vehicle, he tried to decide upon his next move. Obviously, he had to secure the one surviving invader so that he would not be a menace to Parkinson when he revived. And then, the logical thing to do would be, in some way, to secure information from him as to how to cure the disease that was spreading over the world. The logical thing to do, yes, but how? With only one arm, the simple task of binding the Venerian presented considerable difficulty. How much more difficult would it be to force anything from him? Then the solution of the first problem presented itself to Parkinson. What was to prevent his strapping this being into the high back chair to which he had been secured some time before? Quickly, he crossed the circular room to the door he had first passed through while searching for a weapon. Ten minutes later, when the Venerian regained his senses, he was fastened securely to the tall metal chair. Well, Parkinson addressed him, conditions seem to be reversed now, and you're the underdog. I've nipped your invasion in the bud. All your elaborate preparations are wasted. Something resembling a sneer wreathed the Venerian's thin lips. A mocking gleam lit his cold blue eyes. So our efforts have been wasted, have they? I'm afraid I can't agree with you. Already enough bacteria have been released to destroy all life, though it will take longer than we desire. Even though you kill me, our goal will still be reached. The human race will die. A cloud of gloom fell upon Parkinson. He had expected this, but he had been hoping that he was wrong. Then, there's only one thing for me to do, and that is, I'll have to force you to tell me how to undo the damage you've done. The Venerian smiled mirthlessly. You have absolutely no chance of accomplishing that, he said. We've done our work too well to allow any interference now. You do not know this, but we have released upon your world the worst malady ever known to Venus. There is only one remedy, and I'm the only one who knows it, or who has the means wherewith to accomplish it, and I certainly won't tell. The worried expression on Parkinson's face increased in intensity. 
There was something in the Venerian's voice that convinced him that he meant what he said. Then suddenly his countenance cleared, and a happy smile replaced his frown. Perhaps you won't tell, but I think you will. There are more ways than one of forcing you. Parkinson had hit upon a solution to his problem. The Venerians had reproduced his knowledge in their brains. Why wouldn't it be possible for him to reverse the operation? In a moment, he secured the thought transfer apparatus from a case in the rear of the room and bore it to the chair, and in spite of the Venerian leader's struggles, placed it upon his head. He put the headphones over his own ears and began fumbling with the controls. Suddenly, he seemed to strike the right combination. There was a faint, humming drone in his ears. After a moment, this was replaced by a loud crackling, and the knowledge of a man from Venus was becoming his own. Somewhat dazed, Parkinson shut off the current. His mind was in a turmoil. He was in possession of knowledge of such an amazing character that for the moment he had lost his mental equilibrium. Indeed, so strange was his newfound knowledge that he could not grasp the significance of even half of the facts in his mind. But already he knew how, with animal electricity, they had paralyzed him, knew what had happened to him on the operating table, knew the nature of the dread disease that destroyed his arm, the Gray Plague, and knew the cure. A sudden thought arrested this review of his new knowledge. The Gray Plague? At that very moment, incalculable quantities of the deadly bacilli were being cast into the air, and he was doing nothing about it. He glanced at the Venerian. He was still unconscious and would remain so for some minutes to come, and even if he did recover his senses, he was securely fastened to the chair. Parkinson dashed out of the room, crossed to the sphere, and passed through the open doorway. Without hesitation, he manipulated the controls, directed by his Venerian knowledge. Rapidly, the sphere rose to the surface. As it came to rest on the floor of the tower, Parkinson sprang from the car and headed toward a mass of intricate machinery that filled fully a quarter of the great building. Even this caused him no great concern. He was as familiar with it as he would have been had he constructed it. For some moments, he was busy with numerous dials and levers. Then the release of the germs was stopped. Parkinson spent several minutes in examining the contents of the tower, his earthly mind lost in wonder at the strange things his Venerian knowledge revealed to him. Then he entered the sphere again and sank into the meteor. As he moved toward the room that held the Venerian, his mind was busy with conjectures as to what he would do with his prisoner. It was necessary for the bacteriologist to reach the mainland as quickly as possible and make use of his knowledge of the cure for the Gray Plague. He didn't want to kill the man. He couldn't free him. Yet if he left him strapped to the chair, he'd surely die of starvation. Still undecided, he thrust open the door. With a startled gasp, he stopped short. Somehow, the Venerian had freed himself. At that moment, he leaped toward Parkinson. Instinctively, the bacteriologist flung up his hand in a defensive attitude. The onrushing Venerian caught Parkinson's outthrust fist in the pit of his stomach and doubled up in pain. While he was thus defenseless, Parkinson placed a well-directed blow on the side of the Venerian's jaw, a blow carrying every ounce of his strength. So great was the force of the punch that it lifted the man from Venus and cast him headlong upon the floor. His head landed with a sickening thud. Unmoving, he lay where he had fallen. Parkinson knelt over him for a moment, then arose. Without question, the man was dead. The Venerian had solved the bacteriologist's last problem. He was free to return to the United States with his means of saving mankind. Drawing the little metal cylinder from his pocket, he burned the body of the Venerian leader to a heap of ashes, ridding the world of the last invader. Then he turned and entered the glass-lined operating room. Following the dictates of his Venerian knowledge, he crossed to one of the walls and drew therefrom a flat glass vessel, somewhat like a petri dish. This contained bacteria that were harmless in themselves and were hostile to those of the Gray Plague. These germs, brought from Venus, were the only cure for the terrible disease. Footnote 1. The work of the English bacteriologist Thwart in 1915 and the Frenchman de Harrell in 1917, brought to the attention of the scientific world the fact that many bacteria are subject to attack and destruction by some unknown active agent with which they are associated in infected material. 
This agent, whatever its character, changed growing germ cultures to a dead, glassy substance. Thwart advanced the thought that the agent might be a living, filtered virus, although he favored the theory that it was an enzyme derived from the bacteria themselves. De Harrell, on the contrary, believed that this phenomenon was due to a living, multiplying, ultramicroscopic microbe that destroyed certain bacteria. Evidence favoring both theories has come to light, with the result that, at present, controversy is rife. Up to date, the contention of neither side has been proved. Parkinson's adventure was almost at an end. He had not emerged unscathed, but he had won. The details of his further actions need not be recorded. Suffice it to say that he entered the sphere, carrying his precious curative germs, arose to the top of the tower, and passed through a round opening in its side. His borrowed knowledge revealed that the car possessed abilities that he had not suspected. With amazing speed, he caused it to flash across the Atlantic Ocean to the United States. There he saw the frightful carnage that the plague had caused, saw the deserted cities, and was filled with self-reproach because he had not acted sooner. Across the miles and miles of deserted country he sped, following the fleeing hordes, finally passing over the stragglers and landing in the heart of the congested areas. After making a few inquiries, he returned to the sphere and continued on toward the west. He landed, finally, outside the city of San Francisco. A short time later, twisted, deformed, yet triumphant, he was ushered into the presence of the United States government as the man who had saved the human race. End of story, The Gray Plague, Chapter 3. Recording by Roxanne Weber. R-O-X-A-N-N-E-W-E-B-E-R dot com.